In the book of Luke, chapter 15, I'd like to read verses 11 through 24. 11 through 24. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he spent it all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have feigned to fill his belly with a husk that the, swines did, the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's servants, how many of how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great distance off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no worthy to be called thy son. No more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said, to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and bring a ring on his hand, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've allowed us to be here in your house once again. We ask that you would preach, bless the reading of your word, bless the preaching of your word, add to all the, the preaching, and, and uh, enable me to say the things that are necessary. Help us, as we sang just a little while ago, for to look for, to strive for, to appreciate the grace of Which you give us to trust you. Oh, for grace to trust you more, the songwriter wrote. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. We referred to this parable this morning. And generally this parable is, is preached in a couple of different ways. Um, and I'm going to, with the help of the Lord, preach it kind of another different way. And there's nothing wrong with these different, they're not really different interpretations. They're looking just looking at it from different viewpoints. Now, many times this is preached as, okay, these, this son is a lost man. And uh, this is him when he finally decides to come home, to come to the father. And the father greets him. Another says, well, the prodigal son, he was a saved man, but he was backslidden. And so it's, it's usually preached evangelically or um, to try to call the saved back to the place where they need to be. But tonight I want to look at the situation that this young man was in and look at the grace that led him home. Grace that leads him home. Now we understand... The scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So what we read at the beginning of the Bible applies also at the end of the Bible, but also applies to us today. So as Brother Don mentioned in his prayer, and, and, and we preached this morning in Joshua chapter 1, Verse 5, God promised to be with Joshua. 
He said, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I with, was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and be courageous, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now we already quoted Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. But verse 5 says this. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things that ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So if Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and he promised back in Joshua uh, that he would never leave him, nor forsake him. If he promised uh, in the book of Hebrews, and we are reminded by the writer in the Hebrew book of Hebrews, 1,400 years later, that he said he would never leave us nor forsake us and not to worry about the things that we have and the things that we don't have. If that was true in 1,400 B.C., if that was true in the first century, surely it is true today. That same Jesus, that same Jesus that ascended into heaven, that same Jesus that is coming again, made these promises to his people that he would never leave us nor forsake us, And even in the hog pen, that's true. Even in the hog pen, that's true. Jesus gave this parable. Now primarily, and, and we can really see that when we get to the, we didn't read the last part of the parable about the other son. The son that was disgruntled because the, the, he'd been doing all the right things all the time. And um, once again, we always have to add, but his heart wasn't right. You can do the right things and your heart not be right. He said, I've been doing all the right things all the time. And then this young man, this my brother comes and he had taken your money. He had squandered it. And now he's back and you're having a big celebration. You've never done anything like that for me. You're having a big feast for him and his friends. You've never done anything like that for me. Oh, we get in, we get in a... a, a bad situation when we look around and say, God, well, you never did that for me. And he was teaching a lesson to the front of the scribes and the Pharisees. But there are all sorts of lessons we can learn out of this parable. This is one of the longer parables, and there's so many things that we can take away from it. But the thing I want you to see once again is even in the pig pen, he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, he never forgets us, and he never fails to love us. Verse 20. Now this man, by the, by the time we get to verse 20, he's already went on his misadventure. He's, he'd already squandered everything. He'd already uh, been uh, living in the pig pen. He was looking at the pig food and it was looking pretty good to him at that point because he was so hungry. And it says he came to himself in verse uh, um, 17. He's talked about the hired servants. They have many bread. I will go and I'm just willing at this point to be a servant. What a blessed revelation we have when you think, oh, I'm willing to be a servant. So he, he, he thought about what he's going to say. He's rehearsed it, and uh, people do that all the time. Um, you encounter people. They already know what they're going to say, especially if you have uh, uh, deal with situations. You know, Sister Pi works uh, where she works, and she knows that people are already prepared and sometimes already worked up before she ever gets on the phone with them because they're already expecting one thing, and they've got their, their, their speech all planned out. He had his speech all planned out. But it was a speech he never needed. Because he says in verse 20, And then he rose and came to his father. And when he was a, a great way off, his father saw him. 
Now in the parable, we picture this father, and uh, it's been preached many times, how the reason why the father saw him is because, uh, and you know, this is adding to the, the parable a little bit, but it, it, it makes sense that the father would go out every day and look and wonder when his son was going to come home. And he would look out and he would look in, in the distance just to see any sign that the son was coming up the road. It says when he was a great way off, his father saw him. Now we have to apply that terminology because it's talking about, it's a parable about an earthly father. And we know our eyesight is limited. Even the best person with the best eyesight can only see so far. Under the best conditions, we can only see so far. But understand this, when you were far off, when you were still in the pig pen, God saw you. You're never hidden from the Father's sight. God's eyesight is not limited. There is not a sparrow that falls that he is not aware of. And he sees the objects of his love. He sees the evil and he sees the good. God is not limited. Many have found out. Let me get my names right so I don't repeat the error of uh, this morning. Jonah thought he could escape the eyesight of God, didn't he? He was told to go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish. Went the opposite direction. God saw him where he was. God sees you where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in the pig pen. It doesn't matter if you're in the church pew. It doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what your state is. God is aware of all that you do, all that you think, and all that you feel. And he saw him. Now what if the son never came to himself? What if the son said, well, you know, there, there, there's these husks. You know, the pigs are eating them. I can eat them. What, what if he never came to himself? And we know that we do come to ourselves because of the grace of God. And it's God's grace that opens our eyes. It is God's grace that desires us. It is God's grace that leads us to him. When we stray, he leads us back to him. What if he never came to himself? Well, Jesus already spoke two parables about that. One was about a lost sheep. One was about a lost coin. And in the preceding verses of this chapter, we understand the lost sheep was out there in the wilderness. He was lost and the good shepherd went after him. The woman lost her coin and she swept her house. The coin didn't do anything to come back to her. The woman did all the work that she would redeem that coin. Sometimes God gives us the grace to come home and sometimes he seeks us out and brings us home. Whatever the, the case, it is all of God. It's all of God. Now understand this, sometimes we're in a pig pen. This, we, we know the story, we're familiar with the story. This, uh, this it, it is often called the parable of the prodigal son, but I've said before, others have said, this should be the parable of the loving father because all, this, all the things that we see are all about the father's love and the father's love for us. And that's why we're preaching on this passage during this, this series about can we trust God? And we look at this and, well, he belonged in the pig pen, didn't he? He realized, I'm not worthy to be his son. Everything he did drove him to that pig pen, and he went into that pig pen because of his own desires, his own foolishness, his, his, his own uh, um, seeking after the things of the world. Sometimes we end up in the pig pen because of our circumstances. I, I recall back when we, we went to, uh, used to go to the Brown County Jail. 
And I'm thankful to, to say that that ministry is still going on. Brother Ogle still goes in there every Tuesday night. But when I was in Ohio, we used to go to the Brown County Jail and we would take turns preaching. And one reaction I got was a reaction where you could have heard a pin drop. And I talked about Noah in the ark. And it said, and God shut the door. And I talked about all those people that were outside the door. And God shut the door. And I said to those men, if you've never been in a jail, I've been into a, a few, uh, only as a visitor or, or working there. I used to have a job where I'd go in as an x-ray tech and do some x-rays and uh, for, for some of the, the, the prisoners. Uh, but you go in and there's these big, metal, heavy doors. And even though I knew I was there under good circumstances, it gives you a feeling when you walk in and you hear those doors slam behind you. And you go a little further, and that door would slam behind you. And I said to those men there in that jail, I said, you remember the first time you came in here, the first time you heard that big steel door slam behind you, how you felt. How are you going to feel when you're cast into hell and that door is slammed and you know there's no way out? And there was not, these men were, you know, these, these guys, they, they, they were all goofing around all the time and making jokes and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, disruptive at times. They completely shut up. And I had everybody's attention at that time. And the other time, I was preaching on Joseph. And I talked about all the misfortune that Joseph had throughout his life. He, he never sinned against God. He trusted God throughout all of it, but he, he never sinned. And he was thrown into prison. I said, I'm going to preach about a man like most of you in here. I said, he was thrown into jail, and he did absolutely nothing wrong. And they thought about it for a second. They all started laughing. Because that's what they all said. I didn't do anything. It was always somebody else's reason. They, they were all falsely accused. There was not a guilty man in that jail. Sometimes we get into situations. We get into the pig pen. We've not been like this young man. We've not squandered our inheritance. We've not re re rebelled against our father. Sometimes things happen. But we're in there for the father's will. Because of the Father's will, sometimes God allows the pig pen. We don't go to the pig pen. Sometimes God allows the pig pen to come to us. Either way, the question that we've been asking throughout all these weeks, whether you're in there because of your, your, your own actions, whether you're in there because of circumstances that God has allowed, can you still trust God? Can you turn to Him? Can you realize that there is more than enough in the Father's house? Are you reaching out to Him in that situation? God sees you in the pig pen. God knows where you're at. The next thing I want to address is the distance did not diminish the Father's love. At the beginning of the story, before the, the son ever made the request to give me my inheritance now, a couple of days later, when he decided he was going to leave and take it all, go somewhere else, all those days that he was away from the father, and it doesn't give us a time that he was away, we just know he's away. It really doesn't matter how long you've been away. When the father saw him again, when he brought him back into the house, his love was the same throughout all that time. God's love. You, sometimes you think, oh, in the situation I'm in. Once again, it may not be anything that you feel like you've caused. And it may not be anything you've caused. God still loves you just as much. Distance did not diminish the Father's love only... The son's ability to access the father's wealth, the, the, the father's riches. Because he had turned from his father, rebelled from his father, he was no longer able to receive the blessings of his father. 
If you're lost or if you're backslidden, you're no longer receiving the blessings of God. Like Now, God still blesses you. Even lost people, God gives health and, 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 and breath. And so, uh, their sustenance. Even lost people benefit from the grace of God. But the Father still loves us, no matter what. Never doubt that the Father loves you. Now, I've told you that there's been times in my life where I heard a voice that I knew was from God. There was a time in my life when I was the prodigal son. I've been raised in the church. I was still a good guy. Uh, there, there, there were lines that I would not cross, but I wasn't in God's will. I was living for myself. And as I felt him drawing me back, and as I felt, and I started to move back to the relationship that I should have, and honestly, I still don't have the relationship that I should have with God. And if you think you have, you're, you're full of yourself. You can still be closer to the Lord than what you are. You ever when you're laying there and you're, you're, you're not fully awake, you're still asleep, but you're very, very close to waking up. I remember laying in my bed one morning and hearing that voice that woke me up and it said your father still loves you or your father loves you now your father loves you now and I, I realized he wasn't saying well now I love you I didn't love you before what he was saying was even now even now even in the pig pen I still love you Now, what was the, the message the son had prepared? He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to say, well, I'm no longer to be worthy to be your son. Just let me be your servant. Who said that? The son did. Never in this passage, never in this passage did the father ever say, you're no longer worthy to be my child. You don't deserve to be my son. Look at everything you've done. You don't deserve me. It was the son who confessed his own unworthiness. Now look at our father. Look at our father. It is when we realize we don't deserve him as a father. We don't deserve to be called his child, his son. At what point... At what point did any of us ever deserve to be a child of God? Was it when we were little? Was it when we first made our profession of faith? Was it when we first realized that we're sinners and we, and we repented? Was it when we joined the church? Was it when we, when we were baptized? When it was when we started some work? For the Lord, we started teaching Sunday school, we started preaching, we started playing the piano, we started singing, we started uh, uh, faithfully attending. When did we ever deserve to be his child? We've never deserved it. We'll oh. never deserve it. Oh, and this is, this is what grace is. We are his children by grace and by grace alone. Amen. Matter of fact, this, this son never deserved to be this father's son. He was born into that family. I didn't choose my parents. If I could have, I would have. But I didn't choose my parents. That was God's will. For my life. 
God chose me. God adopted me. God brought me into his family. And I've never been worthy. By the grace of God, he came to this revelation that and I know some people will hear that and object to that word revelation. I know it's not used biblically correct. But as far as the, our, our English, that's what we call it. When something comes to our mind, it is a revelation. And, and, and it was revealed to him that my father is good. My father loves me. And I'm going to go to my father. The son drew nigh to the father. James says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The son realized, I can trust my father. I can trust my father. My father is good. I don't deserve to be his son. I, I just deserve, I, I don't, really, he didn't deserve to be a servant, did he? If you were picking out servants, you wouldn't say, well, I want that guy. It is amazing the, 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 God, the, the people that God chooses to use. Why would he use me? There's people out there that know the difference between Nehemiah and Jeremiah. Why would he choose me? There are people that don't stutter when they talk. Why would he choose me? There are people that can read without messing it up. Why would they choose me? I'm not worthy to be a son. I'm not worthy to be his servant. But I do trust God to do great things. When I came down here, I trusted God to do great things. So I'll go down, I'll go down to Girdler and uh, I'll, I'll preach the word of God and I'll be faithful to preach the word of God and God will build up that church. Then I can go back home. I'm still waiting. I'm still preaching. Maybe I just had the wrong idea where home was. God's going to take me home. By the grace of God, I will continue to preach God's word in this place until God tells me otherwise. What was the father's reaction when the son repented? He said he saw him. He was far off. The father saw him. He had compassion. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Many times we're afraid to make a move. Because we're afraid of being rejected. Guys will not ask girls out because they're afraid they'll say no. They don't want to be rejected. They don't want to be laughed at. It was probably very hard for Sister Pie to propose to me, but she did. The Bible tells us that any that will call upon the Lord, will, he won't cast them out. Any that come to him. Now we understand the reason why we come to him is because he's already called us. And he's already pulled us. And he's already drawn us. But, but he will not cast anyone out. So here the sun comes up the road. All cleaned up, all dressed up, looking fine. And the father saw him there and said, well, that's my son. He came still smelling like a hog pen. 
And the father ran out to meet him and fell upon his neck and kissed him. He saw his condition and he had compassion upon him. He went to him. The son had drawn nigh to him, but he went to him. And we already told you that the other parables say that there are times where he'll go and, and snatch you out. He embraced him. He showed his love. He kissed him. And then he met his needs. Verse 22, And the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. That ring, by the way, signified that was still my son. In spite of everything, that's still my son. Put shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. That's what compassion is. That's what compassion is. He, he, he went to him. He embraced him. He touched him. Sometimes people just need a hug. He showed him love. He kissed him. And then he made sure his needs were provided by, for him. Pai showed me a video. She sent me a video. Little girl, what was she, about 12 years old? 12 years old, 10 years old? This little girl, her mother was a nurse at a nursing home. I think she's about 12 years old. And she had compassion on those residents there at the nursing home. And she went and she took a survey and she went to room to room and went to these residents. And she said, if you could have three wishes, what would they be? They didn't ask for money. They didn't ask for the things that the world valued. One lady asked for cheese. One lady, they, they asked for different food items. Things that they missed. Things that they weren't getting at the nursing home. And she started bringing these people. These things. Started out just as curiosity. What could you, would you have if you could have three wishes? Surprising they didn't. And I guess they, they knew it was beyond her ability. You know, you would think, oh, well, you know, my, my wish is to be young again. No, they, they're, they're, they wanted various things that they didn't have that they had missed out of their lives. Things like apple pies and, and, and things that and so she started getting these things and she started a GoFundMe page and raising money to provide for these older people. And she'd bring them in. And they'd want to hug her. They, they, they had no buddy hugging them anymore. They had Nobody just showing them any kind of love. And it meant so much to them. And they would cry over an apple pie. And it wasn't the apple pie. It was that somebody cared for them. If the Father has shown that grace to us, if he has shown that compassion for us, should we not reach out? Luke chapter 3, verse 11. And he answered and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. He told the disciples, As you've seen me wash your feet, go out and wash each other's feet. 1 Corinthians 13.
Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a, and a tinkling cymbal. He said, I'm just making noise if I don't have compassion for others. And if I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not charity, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Well, that's something you think, well, that's a good thing. You know, you, even that you can do without compassion. And though I give, just because you feel, well, I guess I ought to. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Verse 13, now abide of faith, hope, and charity. Of these three, the greatest of these is charity. We can trust God in the pig pen. We can trust God when we're in the Father's house. We can trust God when times are good, when times are bad. As we are trusting God, we need to do God's work and impact others' lives and help others and be a blessing to others. That's the Father's will. You want to be worthy to be the son? You want to be worthy to be a child of God? It's not going to happen. But a big step is to have charity. To have compassion. Trust God to provide your needs enough that you can provide others for others and love each other.